Good afternoon, Dr. Farah Nadim. How are you? I'm good, Tessie. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for your time here on Zoom o'clock today. For the wonderful people out there listening to this who don't know Dr. Farah yet, Dr. Farah Nadim is an expert in FGM, female genital mutilation. You have been speaking in the House of Lords. Uh, you have been writing a book about it. You are an advocate for it. You speak out about it a lot. And mm -hmm. you're also a therapist, uh, a psychologist. Um, and we have been working as well already in the past together. And it's just mm -hmm. such a pleasure to talk to you about FGM today because it's such an important topic. And it's still going on everywhere yeah. around the world. But that's enough for me to explain about your work, can you please tell us all a bit about your work? What is FGM really? And mm. why is it important to talk FGM still today? Well, FGM is child abuse. Uh, and usually the perpetrators are the mother and the father who actually take their daughters to have this act done. It is, you know, I think the difficulty with FGM is that a lot of people see it as a cultural issue rather than it being a global issue. Research now in 2020 have noticed that 90 countries around the world actually do FGM. So what I mean by do FGM is do the cut. So girls get cut. What is FGM? I think, I think we need to make it clear on what FGM actually is. So FGM is a procedure that's done. It's not medical and it's usually done with someone who is not trained. So in some instances where I've worked with FGM survivors, you know, they've had a, a woman who they call a um, witch doctor, which it doesn't mean that they're anyone, or it could be someone from their community. And I think one in particular that I remember was where she smashed a bottle and used a, a smashed bottle to remove um, parts of the young girl's vagina. What usually happens is four different types. There's one where there's a prick, you know, type one is very kind of minute. Type two is they take some part of the labia out. Type three, which is the main, main common one, which actually happens where they take the clitoris out uh, so that the girl doesn't have sexual pleasure. And they sew it up, sew the vagina up that so you only have about this much space. And there's been a lot of complications for young girls where they've had their periods, where they've turned into so tumors, periods have not been released. So many of the complications, sex was described as um, more painful than uh, being pregnant uh, or giving birth. So that usually the common type of FGM is the type three. So this has become a very global issue now. So 200 million girls have had FGM done to them. In the UK alone, around 137 girls have had the cut. And when I mean the cut is actually, uh, you know, the removal of the clitoris and the vagina being so sewed up. So it's literally like, you know, we could show pictures later through this interview, um, you know, um, but it'd be interesting. You could see that it's completely sewed up and all that's left is this, this amount of space. So when you think about it, FGM is, is something that isn't needed. It's, harm, it's a harmful practice and it's seen as ch uh, child, child abuse. Um, you know, here in the UK, the first conviction happened last, last year in uh, 2019 in February. And it was of a, a young girl who was, I think, at the time two and she became four. And it was the first conviction ever. And I think both parents got, I think mother got the most amount, of, I think she got 14 years imprisonment. And that's the first conviction ever. But it was made illegal here in the UK in 1989. And then the law changed in 2003 but it still was illegal from that point. So actually the world was aware of female genital mutilation in 1989. Here in the UK, it used to happen, um, not just, you know, I know at the moment it's seen as an, you know, a lot of people have denounced it as an African issue and said that it's more in African Muslim countries. But here in the UK, it used to happen, you know, uh, in the early 1900s in um, asylums where they used to, where women used to masturbate and, masturbation was seen as a form of um you know deviation for a woman and they used to remove the clitoris then you know and that's seen as like female genital mutilation at that point as well 
And then, you know, we know that it originated from, you know, research shows that it's originated from Egypt when it was a mummification stage. But now it's kind of become a very a, a norm around millions, I mean, not millions, but 90 countries and 200 million women have had this done, uh, you know, and the prevalence rate is very high when it comes to FGM. So even now, currently, you know, when it comes to WHO and UNICEF, they've got research here that's saying that the highest rate at the moment is Mauritius, Malaysia. And then we've got uh, Egypt, and we've got uh, Sudan, Sierra Leone. So loads of different countries that are still very high, that the prevalence rate is so high. Mm. You know, a large percentage of the countries that have it. And even in Europe, you know, we've got, uh, you know, women at risk that currently have it. Is we have Ireland, you know, 1 to 11 percent. We've got Italy, 15 to 24 percent. We've got Belgium, 16 to 27 percent at risk of having FGM done. Greece, 25 to 42 percent of women who are from the FGM community are at risk of having FGM done. Cyprus, 12 to 17 percent. Malta, 39 to 57%, and France, 12 to 21%. So that's Europe alone. So, you know, Europe if I, alone. If I can interrupt you one second, I think that mm -hmm. it's in, incredibly, it's just really unacceptable numbers, first and foremost. Yeah. Um, but you didn't mention Luxembourg. I am from Luxembourg. Tell me about Luxembourg and what is the issue with the statistics from there? So at the moment, we do know in 2016, we know that it, it is occurring in Luxembourg. There is, a, there is a migration towards Luxembourg and, you know, there's research about migration, people from different cultures, different countries that have migrated to Luxembourg. Unfortunately, there's not enough statistics when it comes to Luxembourg for us to say and quantify it and say, this is the percentage rate. There's not even research around Luxembourg and you know asylum. There's not even research around the stuff that that's happened. You know, you know. So we've got research on women that seek asylum because of FGM. We don't have anything like that in Luxembourg. You know, we don't have literally anything where I can say this is the percentage of women in Luxembourg that have had FGM done, or how many are at risk. There's nothing there. We do know it does happen in FG uh, in Luxembourg, but that's about it. So there's not enough for me to say, hey, this is what I found and this is what it says about Luxembourg. But, you know, this is estimated 600,000 women have had FGM in Europe. A year. So, yeah. Uh, not in a year since 2000, you know, since 2016. So not all so far at the moment, the research now, has said 600,000. But you have to understand FGM is um, a, a hidden population issue. And what do I mean by hidden population? Is that they are the, the, it, they're not only covered by culture, it's kind of, it's hidden within families. You know, I, I know women that have had this done in forests, in mm -hmm. places where they've been taken in, you know, Western countries. And they've had this done where the community takes them. You know, we've had people who've said this happened in churches, mosques. So it's not just a, a Muslim issue or... A, so a important Afghan. that you say that, that it is not just a Muslim religious thing. And also that it's not just an African cultural thing. Because no, no. a lot of people I have spoken to and I have spoken up publicly against FGM many times with the UN and also in other, um, mm -hmm. in other conferences. It's really important that people understand FGM is also practiced by Roman Catholics. It's yeah. also practiced by atheists. It's also yeah. practiced by Buddhists. It's also yeah. practiced by people of all faith, all color and all culture. So that yeah. means that it's not just African states doing that. And I think people need to really, really start acknowledging that well currently now in 2020 the highest prevalence rate is in malaysia 90 percent mm. so the highest prevalence rate is in malaysia then it's somalia yeah. so you know if you think about it okay malaysia is not a you know it's an asian country so you, you i think there, there really needs to be a conversation you know the research out there at the moment is of 31 countries and predominantly 27 of them are african countries you know, so the prevalence rates and a lot of the, the research is for, 
you know, those countries. But, you know, there's 90 countries altogether that actually had FGM done. And I think all women are at risk of having FGM and 90 countries where FGM is committed. So I think there really needs to be a conversation around that. And when it comes to Islam, I think the most important thing here is that it's not part of the religion. You know, it's, it's, it, that's, a, that's, a, that's a myth. It actually isn't part of the religion. You know, it is, it is something that's originated from men to control women. It is something about power and to, to reduce sexuality. You know, that, that is a fact, but there is nothing where, it, you know, it says in the Islamic <coughs> religious scriptures, this, is, this has to be done to, to Muslim girls. It's, it's against the religion because it's a harm to children, you know. And I think this is where there's a lot of myths about why FGM has happened. And my own research reflected on how do we therapeutically work with the psychological aftermath? You know, how do we work with women who have had FGM done, what do we need to be mindful about psychologically more than the physical aspect? You know, the physical aspect, I think there's loads of work and a lot of research on that. But when it comes to the psychological aftermath, there isn't much. So my book was one of the first, you know, I've got it here, you know, it was one of the first that really looked at um, a, a practitioner's guide to um, treating female genital mutilation. That's the, the first kind of, research that you know I did um it's come out in the book but then after that I think the next work which I'm currently working with is about working with the different forms of therapy we could have for female genital mutilation moving forward so you know there's so much out there and there's not enough I think work around the psychological aftermath because the act is happening you know, even now there's, you know, new reports saying that in Somalia, because of COVID, there's the rise of uh, FGM, you know, because everyone's in their homes, things are happening. So again, you know, I think it, the, the, the most important thing about FGM it, it is child abuse. And it's about being aware that this is child abuse and working with this as something that the perpetrators usually do be, you know, their parents, unfortunately, in this case, parents, mother usually takes them to have this done. Father's a very advocate around it. But bearing in mind, you know, a lot of people are becoming more educated around FGM from different communities. So we have to take that in consideration. And one thing I think, you know, when, when conversations have happened with people who have had, who have done FGM to their daughters, um, and we've had a conversation with their daughters around what FGM actually is and actually there's no religious connotation to it there is no you know issues around it uh, so there's no it, it doesn't there's no actual you know cleanliness because I think some of the women also saw you know in their cultures and different cultures depending on which culture they're from and who had FGM they see the vagina as being clean if they have FGM done. So that's the kind of myths that were given to these women around why FGM needs to be done or that their daughter won't get married. You know, if you don't get FGM done, you, your daughter won't get married. So there's a lot of myths around that. Um, and the more conversations, the more kind of psychoeducation around what FGM really is with the different ladies from different communities. And I know that a lot of people, have, a lot of activists have done a lot of work around FGM and having those conversations you know a lot of women have agreed that actually it was a very traumatic experience for them and they don't want their daughters to go through that and they don't want to be an understanding that there's not a religious connotation and that actually it's more of a cultural uh, you know a male dominated kind of thought around it to change that so I think there is a lot of change happening but the reality is is that it is continuing to ha happen even though it's, it's become illegal in many countries. And UK in itself, as you've seen, last year had their first conviction. So it's a very important conversation to have about FGM and female genital mutilation. Wow, it's incredible to hear about the first conviction last year happening down now. And, mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's terrifying to hear that corona, because a lot of people don't see the effects of corona um, other than unemployment 
and um, yeah but things like that are happening as well at the same time and are increasing yes. domestic violence as well no one talks about domestic violence and mm -hmm. i think it's really important to to keep the conversation going and your work yeah. is really essential um, i will also put a link of your um book below your youtube video later because i right. think it's really important for everyone really to read because you know you are only as strong as the weakest link of your society and if we allow such practices to being done in a country it has nothing to do with accepting people's cultures it is as you said this is a human rights issue and it's yeah. it's, it's infringing on children's rights specifically here yeah. and it's yeah. a, and we all need to speak up so also for people listening to this if you know someone who has been going through that, who needs help. Dr. Farah is definitely the person to get in touch with. And also, if you know someone who will be experiencing this, if you are a mother listening to this, who is being pressured by your family, that you need to do that to your daughter or any other circumstances, please do get in touch. Because only by you, by people who are being exposed to it or people who know about these practices in their own circles and stopping it, talking about it only like that can it really be stopped so um our time has sadly run out <clears throat> i could listen to you forever i think it's such an interesting topic a sad topic but really important to be discussed um so we will talk offline more about this um please get in touch with dr farah get her book uh, if you can and get in touch with her if you have more questions or write me and I put you in touch with Dr. Farah Nadim with great pleasure. So before I let you go in a nutshell, very briefly, you know, it's a very dark topic to be honest, yeah. especially as a woman, what keeps you going to do the work you're doing? Well, I think the most important thing is the human being itself. I think every person deserves the right to, to just be free and to have a choice and I think in different communities and working the work that I do as a psychologist giving a voice to the unheard is so important to me and I think what keeps me going is the change of when I do my work and seeing the change on vulnerable individuals and seeing them you know say that you know you saved my life today or you know, if it wasn't for you, thank you so much. Like my life has completely changed. And I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Nadine, for everything. That in itself for me, it's just, it's lovely to see that, you know, people can change and change can happen and everyone has a voice. And it's just about caring about the individual and seeing each individual as a human being, whether of their race, color, background, and just, you know, being there as a support, you know, for other people is really important to me in a way that I can provide help in, uh, in, in a, the most empathetic way possible. And I think women and giving a voice to young women who have never had a voice is integral in the way that I work, as well as a voice for young men as well who have, haven't got that, you know, I don't, I think it's not just about gender, but I think an FGM is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's for young women. And I think when you think about it, it's about giving a voice and giving them strength that they've never had before. The strength to say no, the strength to be like, actually, this is not okay. So I think my, you know, my message to everyone is you do have a voice and just reach out for help if you need it. You know, people are there. And um, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to work with thousands of people I have worked with, you know, with this issue and with a myriad of other psychological issues. So I'm just really grateful I've been given that platform and um, I'm really grateful for, for you, Tessie, too. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Farah. And we will be talking offline. For everyone else, get in touch leave your comments please share we need to spread the word and get dr farinadine's book thank you so much thank you